Hey, all you experts out there, this is the Monetize Your Expertise podcast, where we show you how to use your skills to pay the bills. Have you ever wanted to create a business that positions you as the industry leader and go to expert? Join me every week to hear from amazing leaders and entrepreneurs who have successfully refined their skills in order to become experts and create extremely profitable knowledge businesses. To find all of the links and tools mentioned in this episode, just go to myepodcast.com. I'm your host, Grant Worley, the online course guy, helping you every week to monetize your expertise. Welcome back to the Monetize Your Expertise podcast. Today, I have something really interesting I want to share with you. Uh, it's a little bit less business oriented. It's, it relates quite strongly to business, but also your own personal life, right? Because that's actually what matters at the end of the day is your own personal uh, satisfaction and, and happiness with your lifestyle and the business, hopefully, that you run helps you better accomplish that. So before we dive into this, before we dive into the details of today's topic, which is pushing for the no, I want to give you guys a quick shout out. Uh, I got some uh, a couple recent reviews, and I want to give a quick shout out to those people who've left a review on this podcast recently. Really helps me out. So we've got the Wild Petunia, twenty something finance guy. These are screen names, by the way. <laughs> and TRG two SF. So thanks, guys. I really appreciate you leaving a review. It really helps me get feedback and continue to produce this podcast. So now let's dive into the reframing your concept of failure and success because there's a very common way that success and failure is framed, that's very counterproductive. And so let's, let's unpack this. This is also kind of a follow-up to last week's episode, which talked about the mechanics of mastery and the different phases of competency, and basically why it's very psychologically difficult to become very good at something, because you have to suffer through that process of being very bad at something. And it's easy to conclude you're just innately bad, right? So this is in some ways, a mental tweak and kind of a solution to that. So it's a it's kind of a follow up. And if you haven't listened to that episode, um, you might want to pause this now and go back to that previous episode in order to get the most out of this one. If you have already, let's dive into it. So there's a framework that I really, really uh, found quite profound and, and really enjoy, which is the concept of pushing for the no. Now this comes from a I heard this in a talk originally by Darren Hardy, who's the author of The Compound Effect, also a really good book that I've recommended before. Uh, And basically, he was talking about how he used to be in sales, and you can view doing something like sales calls, or really anything, you can view it in a couple different ways. It's very easy to be like, okay, I'm going to make 100 sales calls, and my self-esteem and my sense of success comes as a result of directly proportional to the number of sales that I close, right? That's the traditional way of doing things. But what he was talking about, which I found very interesting, and I've used this ever since I originally heard this idea, is that viewing success as a result is a very flawed perspective. Because in reality, we typically berate ourselves mentally for the results of things. So the outcome of you try really hard to do something, you know, you launch that product, or you try and offer that service, or you try and pick up that new skill, but you just fail over and over again for maybe bad luck or just uh, lack of competency because you haven't had the practice to be very good at it. So you oftentimes probably berate yourself as the result of not being what you wanted to accomplish and then all of a sudden it becomes a failure. But do you see how counterproductive that is, especially when you're doing anything that you're not already amazing at? And even if you are, if something random happens, you know, something randomly goes wrong that's outside of your control, if you kick yourself and view that as a failure, there's, that's just an unnecessary psychological barrier that you've created for yourself. Because in reality, if you're doing the right kinds of things, if you're trying you know, your best with good intentions, that should be the criteria of success. It's not the outcome because you don't always have control over that. And even when you're actively failing at something, oftentimes it's actually a good thing because you're getting better at that skill. But if you're constantly viewing that as a failure, it's a strong deterrent to actually continue doing that. So that mental switch of viewing, hmm, well, I can view the outcome if it's good or bad as success or failure, or I can view 
the concept of what I'm doing and the audacity behind it as the big win. So that's where the, the framework of pushing for the no comes in. It's basically, are you pushing your limits? Are you pushing so hard and trying to do new things, to grow, to expand, just to push forward, develop new skills? And are you doing that enough to where you are failing, to where you are getting told no on, you know, for example, sales calls? Are you getting told no by people? Are you coming up short in a variety of ways? That's actually a good thing in many cases. Not always. You still have to evaluate your process and your method. But of course, if you're doing the right things and you're failing, that's actually a good thing. I'm going to reiterate this a couple times to like let it sink in for you. Um, if you're doing the right kinds of things, but the outcome isn't what you want, if you mentally reframe that as a good thing, then you become encouraged to do it again. And maybe next time the random roll of the dice will be in your favor or you'll just get a lot better at it until you start hitting it out of the park. If you think about it, in many ways the outcomes of your action are actually totally irrelevant. Even though that's the main criteria that we set for ourselves is like, oh, what's the result? Did I ace that test? Did I, uh, you know, land that large contract? Did I win that game? But in reality, the outcomes, again, are largely irrelevant because if you think about it, if you buy a single lottery ticket, right, that's a stupid decision. Mathematically and based on probability, it's a terrible idea. Now, even if the outcome is that you are the winner of the lottery, that was still a stupid decision. It doesn't actually change the fact that that was a bad investment of your, you know, your time and your money to buy a lottery ticket. Just because you got lucky, it doesn't actually change the value or the assessment of what you actually did to achieve that outcome. So again, the same thing can work in reverse as well, right? That was a good unintentional outcome. But if you try to do something great, you know, you try and help somebody and they snap at you angrily, well, you can get deterred or realize that the outcome is independent of the fact that you just did something really good. And unfortunately, this is not how our brains naturally work. But another example that, that came to mind when I was thinking about this topic is when if you have a, a child who's very young and they wet the bed, for example, you know, it's very easy to like be like, no, why did you do that? Uh, whatever. But if you just stop and think about it, it makes no sense. And again, I think this example frames this more clearly. It makes no sense to yell at a kid who pees the bed while they're asleep, right? What is that going to do? It doesn't like tell them to do anything differently. They didn't do anything consciously wrong. It's just, just a developmental stage, right? Uh, and so the same thing is actually very similar when you're trying to do something new. So again, if you're trying to, for example, going back to the sales example, if you're trying to get better at sales and so you're making sales calls and you're quote unquote wetting the bed by failing at the sales calls, well, you can internally yell at yourself as doing something bad, but in reality, you're not doing anything objectively wrong. You're working towards something and then you'll eventually get through that stage just like the kid gets a little bit older, gets a little bit more experience, and that problem naturally goes away in 99.9% .9 of examples. So not only is this effective for your own psycho psychological health, but actually this is something I think about a lot because I think it's very important in terms of the topics of leadership, the, term, the topics of parenting. This is actually something that comes into a lot of different fields and areas. Because, you know, if you're the one providing feedback on something, is your feedback based on outcome or is it based on intention and actions? And I think it's very, very important, not only for ourselves, but for those other people. If you're, you know, if you're the head of the household or if you're the leader of some kind of business group and you react based on the outcome and not the actual intention, uh, it, it can just look very, very different versus doing it more ideally. And going back to last week's episode about the mechanics of mastery, if you recall, if you listen to it, there's the barriers of getting through being incompetent at something to becoming competent at something because naturally, you're not great at something to start, right? So you uh, can have an incompetence where you're not even sure what you're bad at, and then you have to get through that phase to the next phase where you know what you're bad at, but you're still bad at it, all the way to like starting to become good at it, but still very, very difficult for you, until eventually you start to achieve mastery, and it's unconsciously uh, not difficult for you, right? So if you imagine going through that process, and m internally, every time you screw something up, um, actually, in the last episode, I used the example of salsa dancing, so I can go back to that example for this reference. If you're trying to salsa dance for the first time and you keep stepping on your partner's feet, 
Well, that's kind of embarrassing, of course, but if that's your deterrent from ever salsa dancing again, of course, you're never actually going to become good at it. And so pushing yourself to view those kinds of mistakes, like, oh, I just got tripped up, or like, oh, I got lost on the rhythm, uh, viewing that as like, oh, nice. I just did something that was audacious, that was new, that's inspiring growth, so much so that I'm pushing my limits because I just failed. And so you see how it's different than, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing, I have two left feet, I can never do this, blah, blah, blah. Or like, oh, you're so stupid. Like that internal negative dialogue can totally change your perspective about whether you're going to push through those different stages of competency or if you're going to give up. So as I mentioned, this episode's a little bit more, I guess, abstract and uh, psychology-based rather than business. But if you think about what it's like to be an entrepreneur, you're constantly learning new things. You're constantly, to some extent, hustling or trying to acquire new skills or stay on top of what's going on in the market. So things are constantly changing and this applies to that as well. You're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna have to learn a new skill, like there's a new version of Twitter that comes out or something and you still have to learn how to use that. And you're gonna screw it up, you're gonna feel stupid. But if you use this framework, of pushing for the no and viewing failure as actually success because that means you're pushing and working towards something which ultimately becomes the outcome of success. If you view the actual action itself as the success of doing the right thing, it's really a game changer and it's a really nice cure for different psychological barriers that definitely affect, I think, most average people. And actually to relate that uh, and actually kind of end this episode, there's a really good... I'm going to paraphrase really intensely, but there's a really good section of a book that was written by the Dalai Lama, or actually written by a guy who interviewed the Dalai Lama. But anyways, he's a really smart moral philosopher, actually. There's a really good quote talking about anxiety and shame and things like that. And I really liked the way he put it in the book. Basically, the Dalai Lama was saying a really good cure for anxiety and that kind of self-berating attitude is actually just to reflect on the actual actions that you took. Because what you did fell into one of two categories. Assuming that you did the best that you could and with good intentions, there's one of two possible outcomes. So you do the best you can, you're trying to do something good, and you fail, right? Or you succeed. Well, if you succeed, obviously there's no problem. But if you fail, you did the best you could, you had good intentions, but you failed. That's where that mental backlash comes from. But if you think about it, by definition, you just did the best you could. So there's literally no better that you could have done. And as long as, again, you're doing the right thing, it logically makes no sense to be emotionally upset at yourself. Because if you're doing the best you can, then by definition, you'll succeed if it's possible. Or if it's not, you'll fail because it was beyond your possible actions because it's beyond the best you could do. And then there's no point in berating yourself. It's beyond the actual capability of where you are now. And actually the best way to get to that capability is to do it over and over again until the best you can do becomes uh, greater than what it takes to quote unquote traditionally succeed at something. So I hope you take the time to reflect on this idea and hopefully start incorporating it in your own life. Are you currently pushing towards doing something big and are you letting the fear of traditional definitions of failure hold you back? Is there a way that you can see how to redefine in your own head some big things that you want to work on and defining success as the actual pure intentions, solid effort, actions towards that goal? That's the actual success. Is there a way that you can do that in your own life and in your own business? Just something to think about, and I hope you got a lot out of this episode. I've got another great interview coming up soon, so make sure to subscribe. And again, thanks to you guys who left a review, and I'll talk to you again soon. Hey, entrepreneurs and experts, I just wanted to thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope you learned at least one new big idea that helps you evolve your skills and gets you closer to monetizing your expertise and creating that successful knowledge business. Make sure to hit that subscribe button on iTunes and Stitcher, and check out myepodcast.com for all episodes, as well as the tips and tricks mentioned in this episode. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week.